First question to, uh, to get the debate going. Uh, let's go back to the coalition post-2024. Say it happens. How would you position your portfolio today, or how can we position a portfolio today in anticipation of a working good coalition post-2024? So it's only 20 months away. What would you do? Nothing? Would you uh, focus on particular sectors, or would you go big? Wow, you're saying we're going to get a good working coalition that the that's the that assumption the, that the country buys into and the, the, there's an assumption think, that we myself, have a good myself working myself and Pitt are going long South Africa yeah. in a hugest way ever. Yeah, no, you yeah you would go long South Africa and you would specifically go specifically go long small and mid cap SA industrial stocks because those things will just fly. Give us a few, just uh, our, our 2024 portfolio. What well, stocks would we put in there? Oh, something like CMH springs to mind. Um, uh, uh, HEI, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I think the, the banks will do fantastically well. Because um, I, I think one of the things that, holding, that is holding back the banking sector as a whole is there's no risk appetite in the country. People aren't borrowing money to invest, uh, to build things, to make things. So the banks aren't lending out money. And that's the lifeblood of profitability for a bank is credit. They're not accredited to the extent, and they're not extending very much at the moment. So, so the banks will do well because I think such an outcome, if that were to happen, uh, would um, cause investment flows into the country. Uh, a lot of that would be financed by the banks, and I think that would be great for them. So probably thinking aloud, I think the banking sector would be probably the biggest winner. I mean, to give you an example, this morning, I mean, it was done last night, Barclays sold their last stake in ABSA. The last... Uh, 6.3 percent or so, 665 million dollars of stock. That was placed last night at 169 rand, which is about a six multiple uh, and a divvy yield of close to nine percent on a bank with a decent ROE that are fixing things that are growing where credit losses are in check. I mean, you just don't you just don't find those metrics. But as Pitt said, yeah. there's no, there's no confidence. So it's you know you would have. You know, that, if that was at that multiple in a U.S. stock, uh, that well perceived, it would have gone at a 1% discount. It was in a bad market and then taken at a further 5% discount. There's just no real appetite in South Africa for equity. So yeah, that's, a, that's, that's a very interesting point. I think when, uh, when Barclays first bought APSA, that was probably around 2007, I think, they bought into APSA. 2006, 2007. That's probably, that was probably the top of the South African market mm. at that time. They rang the bell at the top, and I think they're busy ringing ring the bell at the bottom again. But that's institutional imperative. They can't do the right thing. They have to be seen to be doing the right thing in the short term, but long term is always the wrong thing. ESG? ESG is, is, yeah, is an interesting one. I mean, obviously, we have, a, as Pitt does, you know, a full ESG process. I mean, many institutions are demanding of you on a daily basis to prove we actually measure all our engagements on our online tracker to see exactly how many of our engagements include anything to do with ESG. The truth of the matter is the world has put ESG uh, you know, too fast, too quickly into the investment regime and you can see what's happened when something, you know, when we stop investing, for example, in dirty oil, dirty or coal. I mean, we now run with one little political event, or a huge, actually, political event of Russia invading Ukraine, and the entire European community is without proper oil reserves or without proper, you know, uh, alternatives because it was all too fast, too quick, uh, and the implications were never properly considered. So I think uh, the world's going to have to revert back. And if you look at what Pitt's main <laughs> two... Stocks he's done so well in the last couple of years, they are not exactly ESG favorites, but they are were, the, were and are the correct place to be invested. So, you know, it's a, it's a tough one. And, and we looked at by institutions, and I suppose they looked at by their ultimate investors as, you know, are we doing the right thing for the environment and, and the future of our children and, you know, et cetera. But the truth is, it's often an antithesis to what investment returns are going to look like. Are you investing in the way 
Pitts investing in those stocks, or are you we are more also investing. With ESG? We are also investing in those stocks. I think when it comes to, for example, a governance issue, theft issue, we take that far more seriously. When it comes to an environmental issue, we ensure that management are taking the correct steps in ensuring that they're also investing, for example, in cleaner energy going forward. They are where they are now, like a Sassel, for example, but what are they going to be doing over the next two, three, five, ten years to ensure that their mix is at least changing in favor of clean energy? So it, it, it's, and I'm going to ask you a, a, a more difficult question in just a moment, but before we move off Sassel, the fact that Sassel is still employing Bain, which has destroyed South African revenue services, do you guys just... Do you, Sai, and Pitt, from your side, do you ignore that and stay invested in Sassel? Do you, uh, do you take a, a view on what the management is, is, is doing? I think it's an investor's responsibility to take these sort of things, uh, to engage with management on these sort of issues. I, I don't think it is correct on to say, I'm not going to invest in this business or this asset because of X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and the same with ESG as well. To decide not to invest in a coal business because uh, somebody out there um, said that there's not a good thing, um, I don't think that's a, that's a rational way of uh, being a fiduciary. Uh, I think if you find that a company like Sassel is cheap and investable, you can invest in it, and then if they do things like employing a dodgy business like Bain, then you can engage with them on it. And you can actually be a force for positive change rather than somebody who just buries their head in the sand. Yeah, so Sassel's an interesting one. I mean, I agree 100% with what, what Pitt's saying. I mean, the truth is a lot of South African investors have no choice, especially in equity mandates. It's the only real chemicals and oil stock we have in the country. Uh, we often look at it and think it's overpriced because we're looking at global peers and we actually own a company in Canada called Suncor, which is cheaper on a multiple, higher cash flows, got proper buybacks, much better management and doesn't have the hedges in place. So we look at it and say, well, Tassel doesn't tick any of those boxes and in fact their CO2 emissions, etc., are far worse. Therefore, we wouldn't actually, on a global scale, if it wasn't for exchange control, we would never be invested in it. But in South Africa, in an equity mandate where it represents X percentage of the benchmark and it's going to perform better than something else, we'll hold it. But again, you need to hold management to account to ensure that they at least come closer to international benchmarks on CO2 yeah, emissions. But hang on, hang on. This is a company, Bain, that took, took billions of rands from South Africa. Billions. But better than that, they ho hollowed out South African Revenue Services, which took hundreds of billions potentially from South Africa's tax base. And Sassel employs them. After the Zondo Commission has exposed all of this, after the British government has banned Bain for three years, and this champion of South Africa continues to employ them. How, do you, how does one justify that? And I'm being a devil's advocate here because you've got to get returns, but surely... You know, we've, we've heard at this conference, pick a side, be committed. Now, if we're going to pick a side for South Africa, we can't just say, well, oh, it's in the benchmark, let's stay with it. We've got to pick a side for the future, surely, for your children, for your grandchildren, so, so, etc. So What's your view to that? No, must I now take our fund, which that's how we're talking now, not our hedge fund. We're talking about our South African equity fund, which is benched against the market, the Capswix index. And I think Sassel's going up, and I mustn't hold it now, and we must underperform on behalf of our clients and our investors because Sassel has got Bain as we can go to Sassel's management and say we want them out, or are we voting you out, we'll vote against you, we'll vote against these non-execs, which by the way, we uh, institution told us the other day, no one like 361 votes against so many proxies in meetings. Can you please tell us why you're so antagonistic? And it's not that we're antagonistic. We like good corporate governance. We'll vote against it. But like ourselves and Pitt, we're not the size of the Alan Grays and the Coronations. So we're not probably going to move the needle. But we get them eventually to hopefully stop doing things like that. But we, I can't change the Isle of Sassel overnight. I, I think try? engaging as a, as a shareholder, engaging with management on these sort of issues is much more powerful than not buying a share and 
hoping it goes away. Fleetwood Krobler was, was, was on our program the other day, and I asked him about this, and it wasn't, I warned him, I would be asking him, and I wasn't going to enter a debate because it was their results. But basically he said, yeah, well, we don't think there's any reason why we should be not doing it. And that's the internal view of Sassels, and it has been since before the Zondo Commission. So have you guys been engaging with them? Do you own their shares, maybe, first of all? So, so in the value fund, I own Sassels shares. We have engaged with them on it. Whether they listen to us as a very small shareholder is immaterial. Having said that, I mean, Sassel has a reputation of not having had the best management consistently over time. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that they're probably not listening to us. But it is a matter that we can take up, you take it up, and if enough people take it up, if enough shareholders take it up, maybe they'll start listening. I think what I'm getting to is where do you guys individually draw the line on these kind of issues? Where do you draw the line? I hear what both of you say about ESG, but where do you draw the line? What is too bad? Would you, for instance, Russia versus Ukraine, if you, do you have, can you pick a side on that side? Would you pick a side? Uh, is there, a, is there any, at any point in time, a binary issue in South Africa that would affect your investing I, th I think approach? where one draws a line, <clears throat> where one draws a line is the things that can affect your clients' outcomes negatively, substantially negatively. That's where you draw fraud, like Steinhoff. We never invested in Steinhoff. We were quite vocal about it. Um, those sort of things, because the, the eventual outcome there is very negative for the client. So that's where we would draw the line in a binary fashion, not invest where future possible outcomes are very negative for the client. <clears throat> if Sassel chooses to continue using Bain as a consultant in a portion of their business, it doesn't reflect well on management. In fact, it reflects poorly on management and the business, but that is not going to change the earning stream that Sassel generates and the free cash flow it generates and the dividends it pays. Um, so to the extent that those cash flows are undervalued by the market and there's an opportunity to make money for your clients, yes, we'll do that. But we will still engage on these issues, but avoid the ones where there is a, where there's fraud or massive uh, negative consequences to the clients from investing in, in this specific asset. I'd say one other thing that, that's bothered us over the years, where there's a mass massive social impact that's mm. almost done on an unjust basis. So African Bank was one of those examples. If you looked how clients were charged um, fees and you know, interest rates that were effectively above the usury act, and various consolidation methods that were applied to clients' loans. And, uh, you know, we had a proper in-depth look at that, and we knew that business wasn't sustainable. And we never invested once on the long side of that business, uh, right through its growth, growth stages. And uh, that, for us, was at least the S would have failed, and government also would have failed, in fact. Um, but I agree with Pitt. Uh, you know, if Bain took over the management of Sassel, different story. But they're really just a consultant. Yes, they probably shouldn't be using them. But look what happened with KPMG. You know, you can't say the entire organization is fully rotten. You know, Bain has still got very smart, strategic people. I have no doubt the whole of Bain is not corrupt. Um, and yes, we will push Sassel to, to use other consultants. But... It's well, not they don't make they don't, so uninvestable. Too. They don't accept responsibility. Surely no. they're not corrupt. They've been banking the profits. Yeah. And they've, the partners in London have made a hell of a lot oh, yeah, of money. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and yeah. The, the British government says no. Anyway, let's not get bogged down in that. Sire, what in Pitt's presentation do you violently disagree with? <laughs> so I don't violently disagree with anything that Pitt says. Pitt's very smart, done phenomenally well. Um, I don't agree 100% with the way he looks at macro. So that's where we're probably a little bit different. I agree on parts of it, the first part, which you can't forecast what's really going to happen with macro. And you can't forecast the softer parts of macro, what interest rates will be in two years' time, what growth rates will be, etc. But I think you can forecast industries and economies, and you can see who is growing, who isn't growing, and how those changes are coming about. You know, where we've had this little inflation rise now, where COVID came in 2020, when the banking crisis came in 2008 into 2009. There have been a lot of changes in cycles, and I think if you've read those cycles correctly, 
you could have positioned your portfolios better. And we do that a lot. So we move our portfolios around extensively. By the way, Sean won't like that either. It does add to your TER, you know, because trading costs are costs that you spend at the brokers when effectively you're selling your Anglos to buy Standard Bank, etc. We do move our portfolios around more than most. In fact, pretty aggressively so when we think the environment is changing or an industry is changing or a company dynamic changes. So that's where we probably differ. Um, we spend enormous amount of time in Jackson Hole, which came on Friday. Um, we went and studied all the speeches ahead of time, looking at Powell's statements, looking if he was ever wavering in any way to become a little bit more dovish rather than orcish. Uh, and we predicted it. We'd cut our net equity, we'd put options on, the market got slammed, we never got impacted. So that's, we do that. That's, that's like where we think we can add extra performance. It's different to what Pitt does. Do you want to respond to that and then tell us what part of size address you disagree with, Pitt? Yeah, um, uh, with respect to Jackson Hole, you know, my only opinion on that is I hope, I wish there was a big hole would swallow all the central bankers <laughs> and just get rid of them. Uh, but other than that, I have no opinion on Jackson Hole and anything that came out there. I didn't read anything there, so it's very different. I mean, our approaches are, are very different. But it's very important to understand that there isn't one way of skinning the cat. There are many different ways of skinning the cat. There's size way, there's my way, and there's 10 other different ways. The important thing is to do whatever you do consistently. Make sure it's, it's a sensible thing and then do it consistently. I think if you do that, then you will have success. And Sign 361 have been very, very successful with what they've done. It's very different to the way I see the world now. I do things. But I believe that what I've done over time has been done consistently and has had good outcomes as well. Uh, and there are other people who do things, in a, uh, again, in, in another way. As long as they do, do it consistently, it'll be fine. Um, so I, it would scare me to sort of um, move assets around aggressively. Um, I, I'd rather uh, do the work, understand the business, and just let the management get on with the job of generating cash flows for me and my clients and just leave it alone. But that's my style. It's not which, which by the way, is, is unbelievable for an investor. If you were to choose six or seven different styles and put them all into a bucket, you know, you're diversifying your risk. You've got totally different strategies. It works well. And there, there are these kind of strategies all over the world. I don't think, you know, you pick any two companies that are identical. And it's, it's good to know that you can do things many ways. So, so I think the, there's an opportunity for investors here where I think there is... There is too much money in the big fund managers in South Africa and globally as well. Not only in South Africa, the big fund managers have too much money and they are like the index minus fees. So you're guaranteed to underperform. Whereas you can rather put your money into the index or the bulk of your money index and choose a couple of smaller fund managers like 361 and a couple of others that do different things and add that to your index position and you'll get index plus. That's a much more sensible way, I think, of allocating money than giving it to the big three because the ads are nice and they make you feel comfortable and warm and fuzzy and so on. So what about size presentation would you disagree with? Um, uh, yeah, I, I think what, what, I can't disagree with it. What would make me uncomfortable is taking a view on the future and backing that view because I'm not sure I can see what's going to happen in the future consistently well to do that. So that scares me. They obviously have been able to do that, and kudos to them for that, but I, I wouldn't be able to do that. So, so that's something I wouldn't, makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't disagree with it. I just, it's not for me. Okay. Gert, in the front. Uh, Joe, would you give Gert the... Yeah, right in the front. Right in the front. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. <clears throat> I don't know whether it's a fair question, uh, and I also know that... P doesn't have all of size products and vice versa. I don't think size is a value fund and Pete is, is, I think, long only. But if we were now to look back one year, three years, say five years and ten years, I mean, which of these two gentlemen have now performed better than the other one? I'm sure we will are not you be looking, Are you looking at relative performance here, yeah. 
No, just the two of you. <laughs> in other words... Well, which fund, which fund are you that's, taking? That's, that's the problem. We have multiple that, different funds. I realize that's so, so the I, I, I would say in, in the different products, uh, in the equity space, I think the value fund has been the best equity fund over measurement periods. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, your hedge fund has been the best hedge fund in the hedge fund space over multiple periods. Um, but they're different, very different products. So if you were investing in a unit trust equity fund... Funny you enough, in be the, with in Pitt hedge fund, you'd be with Sai. In the raging bull that Pitt just won for a three-year performance in the equity category, our fund, our equity fund was second. Yeah, by not a that very you would small know margin. That. Not that you would margin. know that because only first counts. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was actually second in the in the category. So we were actually, even though we were, we were different strategies, yeah. the actual performance was close. Yeah, and it's achieved very differently. Which and I achieved think, totally yeah. differently. Yeah. Now that's interesting. Not just that you were one and two, but the one and two is sitting right here. How privileged are we? <laughs> and just to say, it, I don't know what Pete's done, but if you go back in different years, it'll be different. This year's performance might be different. You know, it depends on the what period. So you can't say over, you know, maybe Pete's better over eight, we better over ten, he's better over twelve, yeah. we better over four. I it's but I think the outcomes, the outcomes from both of our firms yeah. have been good over time. They have been less well times, less good times and better times, but over time, the outcomes have been good for clients. Thank you. Uh, Claude Ribi, I just want to find out from you guys, and I, and I haven't seen Alec accusing any of you of being pathologically um, passionate about South Africa. Mm. Yet. So maybe this could be a challenge for you guys to allocate some of your money to private equity, some good companies out here in South Africa that needs funding for scaling. And those companies can give returns that SAI have so uh, eloquently uh, put on the, on the board that exceeds that. Because though our companies that are not listed are not seeing the feedback from the banks and the support from the economy. And I think that's, that will give you guys the patch of Pathological South African. Thanks, Claude. I, I, I like that. You actually articulated it far better than I did because I was trying to find out what are you doing for the country? I mean, yeah, you're, I'm doing well because I'm growing investments for the clients who are investing with me and we need savings and that's good. But what about that thought? Yeah, so we have, we have a lot of social programs actually. It's interesting enough because... Um, we don't agree with the way BE's been done in South Africa. I'm sure Pitt would probably agree with me as well. Uh, but we've invested, and uh, anyone who's happy to approach me one-on-one, -on -one, I'm happy to discuss it, but not in a big forum, serious amounts of money in various different programs, um, from education uh, to sport uh, to various initiatives during COVID, helping feed, you know, in many cases, tens of thousands of people. So we've invested a lot of money in South Africa in our own initiatives. It doesn't unfortunately count for anything in business, but on a personal level we have, and in private equity, which I'm happy to discuss with you as well, we've done a lot. Um, and it's not in 361 public funds, but we have a responsibility. And within our own firm, we've got a culture of helping uh, previously disadvantaged individuals to the extent that I think we've got probably the two highest qualified female analysts in our team that I would compare to any other asset manager in the country. They're both BCom, BX, CAs, finance honors, master's honors, and then graduates, one from uh, MBA from uh, UK, both from UK universities, one from LSC, and one from Oxford. One from Oxford, every single degree is cum laude. So we've grown these people up. We also have bursary programs. We have a traineeship program. You know, we took a guy recently off the streets who emailed us, a uh, engineer who had a passion for markets. We've grown him within our firm to become a trainee analyst. We're doing it the way we think is right in South Africa, and we've had a pretty broad reach, I think, overall. And that's that's our goal. Our goal. Um, and people who know me in this room will know I'm a who know me personal, my personal life. I'd like to support many types of charities and give back, and only South African ones. Yeah, I think uh, many firms um, 
Light 361, um, operate outside the spotlight and do a tremendous amount of good in the economy. Um, I know at our business we have a foundation which we started, which we donate a percentage of our after-tax profits to, and that foundation supports educational initiatives. So we do that. Uh, we don't advertise it, but we do that. We think it's important for the country. Um, and I think you mentioned the uh, private equity. We have a significant private equity business as well. Um, and we're quite active there. Um, and we invest in private business in South Africa quite actively. So we do those things. You know, if we had to take everyone in the room and add up the contributions that they're making, like the ones you've volunteered now, I think we'd be quite astonished because people who live in South Africa and stay in South Africa and committed to South Africa, given the odds against us, Claude, I think we all pathologically passionate because otherwise we simply wouldn't be here. And thanks for sharing that with us. I know it's not something you talk about often, but it is, a, it is again a, a becoming increasingly part of, of the decision-making process for people where they allocate their resources. It's not just that they'll get the highest return on investment, but there has to be something more to it as well. Um, Anthony. So, I, well, firstly, Pitt and Sai, thank you for your insights. It's, I'm sure we could all sit here for hours and listen to the two of you. Sai, how do you change the perception of hedge funds in South Africa where the general or uninformed public think it is risky and to be avoided, and yet the whole reason for hedge funds is to de-risk, and you've shown that you can outperform. Yeah, it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge. I mean, the word, the term hedge funds globally, uh, we've seen the likes of Bernie Madoff over the years, and hedge funds on a global scale are defined very differently to how they are regulated here in South Africa. So for those of you who don't know, a hedge fund overseas it can be in anything. You can be in geared agricultural cows, um, you know, or, or or anything. It's just it's so broad. But South African South African hedge funds are very narrow in their investment capability, and they are very highly regulated. And in our space, in the equity long short or the equity market neutral, have significantly less risk. Then pretty much all, and we're talking against my own, our own products, less risk in our balanced funds, less risk in our flexible funds, less risk in all our equity funds. Uh, they are our lowest risk products. Um, and, I, and what we have started doing, which is interesting to a lot of IFAs around the country, we've started running Hedge Fund 101 workshops. So we've brought people in from the outside and we've said, look, this is, and the difficulty with that, obviously, is not all hedge funds are the same either in South Africa. So even in South Africa, there are different risk hedge funds. But as a general classification, it, it should, and it, if it's run correctly, should be far less risk than that. And I suppose you, it just requires time and education to try and show people exactly what you do. The problem often is the complexity when you start bringing in derivative structures and all these other shorting, for example, and people can't get to grasp with what is a short, you know, short sale and how that operates, etc. Um, Alec, if I could just ask, you know, I'm overseas. I, I, I've just seen how some of the things, some of the shortfalls, I think, are prevalent in CISA. But if I could just ask. Um, Sai and Pete, if you know what what voice are the small fund managers given in a CISA, and um, and and what would you do to improve things for South African savers in terms of the regulation? <laughs> Where do you start? A CISA is a platform for large fund managers to impose their views on the rest of the market. Absolutely, the end. That, that's it. <laughs> I'll even give you this. I actually think they have a, a motive to try and ensure we remain small. Yeah. And in fact, there are some letters and drafts and stuff against hedge funds because most of them are not in the hedge fund space um, that make it difficult for hedge fund companies to reach the, the mass. You know, and it, Whether it be taking forever to put your hedge fund on a platform, for example, you know, because it looks a lot better from a risk perspective to to their long-only funds uh, is one of the things 
you know, we've, we've noticed. Are you members of ASISA? We are members, yeah. So we why are you a member if it's no, you, you weighted have to, against I, you? I think we have to be a member, don't we? So ACC does do some good stuff. They are a voice for an industry when it engages the government. I mean, that, I think it's important to stand together to do that. So there, there are certain positive aspects to ACC, which is why we remain a member of it. But by and large, it functions as a platform for the large asset managers to suppress competition in the market. That is a fact. So why are you a member? Because there are some positive aspects to it that but, you need but, to be part of. But if you're allowing it, to engage on your behalf with the regulators, aren't you supporting a system that will be perpetuated, which is weighted against you? Yeah, it, it's a bit of a catch-22 situation, but that, um, in life there are many, many such situations that you're yeah. faced with. And it's better to be in the tent fighting there than it is to stand outside shouting at the tent. I think, I think overall, overall they do a good job. In that regard, I agree they are scared of new products and new innovation, etc., but they do uh, help uh, against government. Have you read Jordan Peterson, guys? You too. Okay. Yeah. I mean, surely we're talking here about order and chaos. Classic. Order. You chaos. Or supposedly chaos. And there's order. Well, they, yeah, they see you as chaos. They, you are a risk. 361 and counterpoint and other people are a risk to their profit pools. And they will do whatever it takes to protect those profit pools. Because they are significant profit pools. And yet you're speaking with one voice with the regulators. Anyway, so it's just a, just a thought. Look, I think it goes further than that. You've got tied agents and you've got incentivized IFAs. It's not, you know, we are up against a lot of other uh, uh, yeah. difficult issues. You're up against a lot of odds. And, we, uh, don't have, we don't have airport ads and things <laughs> and TV ads. And, and the truth is, I think if you're selling a product and something goes wrong, your client's very happy to hear, you know, but I had you at Alan Gray. Alan Gray had been the best. But if you said, I had you at 361 or Counterpoint, I said, who are they? Why, why did you do that? Mm. So, so I think a lot of times it's just go with what's known. Yeah. If we'd done that, I'd be working for Business Day. I'd still be working for Invest Day. I'd be working for 91, yeah. yeah. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, a quick question, because uh, both of you are heavily focused on South Africa. Um, I'll just say, I'm not, I'm not picking you, I just happened to open your fact sheet of your long-only uh, foreign fund, and it's down 17% this year, so I'm not picking, please let me just highlight that. What is, I it, just is, want it, is it better or worse than the index? It's better, so let me just highlight okay, that, so 100%. That's the point, yeah. But I just want to ask, I mean, relative to your South African protection of capital, yes, uh, you've done a phenomenal job over the, through the cycles in South Africa, and then obviously the, no, offshore, Do you, is it harder to operate uh, in offshore markets. Yeah, so are you a big fish in a small pond and you're just really good at it it's here? It's a great, do do it? great question. It's a great, great question because we've only gone into the long only, similar like portfolio to call it to Sean or again, Sean, I think he mentioned by his own admission, he was slightly behind the benchmarks as well, but um, we similar to the benchmark or so over time. It is a much tougher market. And there we're trying to compete, for example, against the all cap world index. There's 1,700 stocks. There are sectors in there that we're not specialists in, whether it be biotechnology or oil diggers or whatever, oil rigs, et cetera. You know, and you need a vast number of people to analyze that. And that's why our team, in fact, has been growing. I believe the future of 361 is in that space. So you know, you're looking at a long only product that's fully invested. And it's done better than the market. So that tells me that we've actually done a good job this year. In our hedge fund, for example, where we also do invest offshore, our best contributor in the current year has been the offshore markets. Not actually on the long side, but on the short side. We short a lot of these tech bubble stocks that emerged over COVID without earnings and valued on 30 and 40 and 50 times revenue without the prospect of ever making a cent in our view. And then we saw this inflation interest rate rise and we realized long duration stocks would be hammered. But so I think South African managers need to get better. I mean, you've now got the regulation lifting to 45% of your total assets. It makes it scary for those who don't have international capability. What we've done well over the last three or four years, we've entered into partnerships with bespoke groups globally that have small research groups, five to 10 people. So we've expanded our group of 12 investment professionals to probably 50 or so. 
and we're working with those 50 when it comes. And within our own team, we've created international specialists as well. Uh, I'm spending my time probably more 60, 70% on offshore than on local, actually. Um, and I think over time, we'll all get better at it. And I think you're doing South Africans a disservice if you're only focused in, on the SA market. But like we both think, the SA market is cheap. We have a proper competitive advantage in SA because big institutions like the PRC, and I hope no one's from here, they are a bit lazy in moving around their assets. Uh, and we often can buy off them or sell you know, to them, etc. And we have a big advantage here. And I think our speed of ability and nimbleness in the market makes it quite easy to make money here, even if it's more attractive offshore. And again, a lot of stocks that are international are also listed on the South African market. But you've got a point. And I think that uh, longer term, that is a scary place. But at 361, that's our, that's our next goal, to become good at that, that we can consistently beat that index offshore as well. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, could the panel talk through NASPES and process, please? What they think the future looks like, whether they think the value unlock will happen, um, and if they think, you know, it's such a big portion of the South African markets, what they think ultimately will happen with those two. Thanks, Benji. Do you want to start? Pitch, you've said enough, I know, with me. <laughs> yeah, look, um, I think that my, my view is that they will struggle to unlock the value because the only way to really do it is to unbun unbundle Tencent completely. And I don't think they really do it. Um, they, must, they also need to stop um, investing in all these money-losing ventures that probably many of them have no payoff profile eventually. So the market will continue to 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 penalize them for that um you know it's uh, so I, and i think the structure is just very complicated cross shieldings are terrible things uh they are sort of trying to unwind it but they've got themselves they've painted themselves into a corner and it's a very hard corner to get out of uh, i can't see them doing that with a current team in place um it's virtually impossible so i think the discount will stay at the 30 40 percent level for for as long as the current structure is in place. And I think the current, there's no incentive for these guys to, to get the current structure uh, fixed. Yeah, so I think the unlock has happened. I think we just saw it happen um, to the extent that it can happen. I don't think it can really happen more. I mean, the stock was trading NASPAS at a 60, process at a 48, 46. You're now looking at 30 and 20 as the That's two. That's discounts. Yep. That's discounts. As a percentage of the discount to its underlying value, and if you look at holding companies around the world, that's, that's pretty consistent. And it's not only reliant on the holding in Tencent. They have many other investments, but the majority, the real valuable asset is Tencent. So to me, the future of the performance of NASPAS and Process is now purely around how Tencent is going to perform. It's got nothing to do with the, un with the unlock. They've made it very clear they're going to sell 10%, maximum of 10% of their holding in Tencent per annum. That's 3% of 10 cent equity. So it would take 10 years for them to sell it. Doesn't mean that they're gonna continually sell for 10 years. Um, they got themselves in a hell of a mess by doing this cross holding. A good, absolute mess was the wrong way to go about it. But uh, you know, management did try to look after themselves and uh, specifically new management. And we had a really big issue with that and hit them head on. And uh, we didn't come out winning on that. Uh, so they took the wrong road. They're now trying to correct that. Uh, they're doing the right thing. They're going to try and unwind as much of this cross structure as they can. Uh, it's going to land up with eventually a big tax bill. And now is actually the time to pay it while the stock is depressed relative to its all-time highs. The, the, the bill would be somewhere around 12 billion US dollars payable to the SA Revenue Service if they, if they, if they get rid of the entire cross holding and uh, become one pass to disappear and just become process. Uh, and, I, and we think they should trigger that, in fact. So uh, if they do trigger that, you might get a small uplift in the, in the discount, but largely that discount has happened. And you're now going to have to look at what is your base case on the Chinese internet regulation growth. And from here, that's, you know, that's probably quite a risky bet. So at 361, we had a massive position in NASPAS for 14 years, overweight, everything. We 
in the middle of COVID, it became ridiculous. We cut it like right out. And but, but just to follow up from what Benji said there, with the latest quarterlies of Tencent, it's the first time that their revenues have actually declined. So they're not an exponential company anymore. They certainly don't, don't uh, qualify in that definition. Is that something that you would also work into your view? And, and effectively, China, maybe you could, you could talk about that, Tencent, and then talk about China well, generally. Well, we actually liked that this Tencent number for us was actually the first time that Tencent management were a little bit more upfront with information within their own business. They admitted they were going to buy back shares, which they haven't done for some time, in real significant quantities, which was interesting because they know Nuspass has obviously been selling their Tencent out, and obviously they've felt that they've done damage in the Tencent market because uh, they started selling at 300 Hong Kong dollars and it was now closer to 400, closer to 300. So I think the time was opportune. And obviously, like most tech businesses, Tencent came off a very high base in COVID. I mean, everybody was at home playing games and, you know, technology was good. So we did expect this year to be poor. And I actually think that business is starting to look actually more interesting now. So numbers are bad. They might be bad for another couple of quarters. But the rhetoric for the first time looked better from management than we'd seen in the last eight to ten quarters. But you're a macro guy. Yeah. So President Key being elected president for life in China, the, the, the attack on capitalists in that country, does that not worry It does. You? That's why we don't have a really big position. So we like the metrics, the valuation. It's trading at less than half of its all-time high. Technology is not disappearing, nor is gaming. They're at the forefront of a lot of industries in technology. But you've got the China risk and the China discount, and it's going to take a while for the world to believe in China again, I think. What I find surprising is that people don't want to invest in South Africa where there is contract law in their courts who can protect you as a shoulder against all sorts of things, but they're willing to put a significant amount of the assets into a company which is predominantly based in China where contract law is not well established, where your rights are not uh, dominant of any over government rights and where the government doesn't care about shell, it cares about the welfare of the people. It's a communist socialist environment. I, I find that whole cognitive dissonance quite quite amazing. Yeah, can you imagine if Johan Rupert were to disappear like Jack Ma did? Exactly. What Jack would Ma happen to the South African market? You know, I, I, I just find that amazing. Okay, last question. Here we go. John, my golf partner. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sai, and, and thanks, Pete. Um, as uh, business leaders, and, and, and uh, both of you have, have done phenomenally well in South Africa, and we heard earlier from, uh, from Charles um, with, with Easy Equities, is there, is there still a future for, for us as, as young South Africans in this country? Are there still opportunities to, to build great businesses in South Africa, or, or should we leave South Africa at this stage? I think I very definitely think there is. I've been part of building businesses in South Africa now for 20 years. And just over, we've been part of a business that's been built over the past seven years, a significant retailer uh, built by young people. And it's very successful and continues to grow quite rapidly. And it is an amazing success story. I don't know if any of you know of Safari Outdoor or Outdoor Investment Holdings. That is a great business that's been built over the past seven years, effectively. And there's many, many such stories. Um, I think with the absolute dearth of available capital in the country, because everybody's capital is going offshore or being given to the large fund managers, guys who just invest in Anglo-American and Bulletin and one or two other stocks, nice perhaps, the dearth of capital available creates massive opportunities for anybody with a little bit of capital and a little bit of initiative. The complete collapse of government services creates massive opportunities to supply those services to a market that needs them and is willing to pay for them. So I think in an economy like South Africa, there are massive opportunities. Uh, one just needs a bit of fortitude of dealing with incompetent governments and municipalities and that sort of thing, but the opportunities are there. There is no doubt about it. Yeah, well, I think there's two answers to that question. I think if you're a professional and you want to go to university and you want to study and you want to get into a good corporate and that's what you'd like to do, it is a bit limiting. It is a bit limiting. But as Pitt says, the amount of opportunities on the ground, if you can create something, 
there's really not that much competition. There's a fortune for sale. There's lazy businesses. Uh, there's an entire, you know, new communities out there that are need products and services, and it's just not available. And yeah, I think there's, you know, put your feet on the ground, you go out and look. I think there's more opportunities than you'll find anywhere else. Uh, but it's not going to be your traditional jobs, unfortunately. And that's the problem we have in this country. I mean, I got some actuaries who came to me a while ago. They said that 50% of the actuarial class at WITS can't find VAC jobs. You know? So I said, but you guys are smart. It's going to change. The world's changed. You know? It's, it's, you need to start doing different things. You guys are you're smart. Unfortunately, it's not going to be working and doing uh, actuarial valuations at Liberty Life or at Discovery. It's going to have to be something different now. So I think that's, that's, that's the difficulty. It's the opportunity, but it's not the traditional opportunity. So if I read you correctly, entrepreneurs, this is a great, great opportunity. If you are not entrepreneurial, not everybody is, then you could consider an alternative future. Is that what I'm hearing? Probably. Unfortunately so, yeah. I mean, I hope it improves, yeah. If we get a new government and growth <laughs> initiatives. And 2024. Yeah. May 2024. Roll on 2024.